I hope they'll turn with me in a Bible to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19. And today we will be looking together at verses 28 to 44. Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 44. Let's read this together. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner, owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. The scene of Jesus riding into Jerusalem is recorded in all four Gospels. But each Gospel places just a little different emphasis on what this means. All four complement one another, but there's just a little different shade of emphasis in each. And in the Gospel of Luke, what is being emphasized is peace. Both the arrival of peace through the arrival of Jesus and the absence of peace when Jesus is rejected by the vast majority of people in Jerusalem. And if there was ever a word that we needed right now in our times, on Palm Sunday in this year of our Lord, 2022, surely it is a word about peace We need the emphasis here because all around us, what we see is the absence of peace. With war raging in Ukraine and daily reports of atrocities, we need a word about peace. With mental health reaching a breaking point, with so many hanging by a thread, 
We need a word about peace. With even churches being ripped apart by conflict and struggling to understand what they should be doing and where they should be going, we need a word about peace. And with the angst that we all feel within us in the midst of this angst-producing world, in the midst of so much uncertainty, in the midst of so much heightened tension and conflict, even within our own families, we need a word about peace. The reason we struggle with thinking about peace is because we can almost reach it. It's just beyond our grasp. We, we can experience it in these small doses, these seasons, these times where we feel at peace. But then it just seems to slip away. We can't hold on to it. You felt this? And what I hope to show you is that Peace will always be that way apart from Christ. It will always remain just beyond your grasp. Peace will always remain just beyond your grasp until Christ himself becomes your peace. Not just what Christ does for you. We absolutely need that. But we need Christ himself to be our peace. And this is echoed in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, in the second chapter, the 14th verse, where he says, For he himself is our peace. He's reconciled Jew and Gentile. He's reconciled sinners to a holy God. He himself must be our peace, or there will be no peace permanent, lasting, abiding peace. Oh yes, we can experience seasons. There will be the times like the Pax Romana, times where it seems like the world is finally heading in the right direction, and we feel an optimism about that. But it doesn't last. As soon as this leader, as soon as this Caesar passes off the scene, war returns. But for so many of us, if you were to ask us, what needs to happen in the world for there to be peace? I'm sure we all have some answer. Apart from Christ. If only so-and-so were not in power. If only so-and-so were elected. If only I could be with this person. If only I could have this job. If only this would end and be over. If only the economy were in better condition. And we could go on and on and on and on. If only. But what Jesus is showing Jerusalem and what he's showing us now by the Holy Spirit is that there is only peace in Him. If only we would listen to Him. If only we would surrender to Him. If only He would be Lord of our lives and of this world. If only we wouldn't let these moments, these opportunities pass. But alas, peace is so elusive. It just escapes our grasp. But before we go any further, we need to be clear about what peace is. What is peace? Well, certainly it involves the absence of conflict. But the way Bible, the Bible def defines peace is rooted in the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom. And in fact, the city of Jerusalem derives her name from 
Shalom, Salem, Shalom. This is supposed to be the city of peace. And Shalom conveys a sense of wholeness, a sense of well-being, a sense of contentment, a blessedness, that all is well. Shalom, peace. That's the peace that is available through Christ Jesus and through Christ Jesus alone. So we can define it. We know what it is. We've tasted just just a little of it. But why is it so elusive? Why does it escape our grasp? Why can we not hold on to it longer? Well, it comes down to this truth. Peace is painfully elusive because this world is estranged from the source of peace. God. And peace will always be painfully elusive as long as this world is estranged from the source of peace. Peace derives from God. Look at what Jesus is saying to the city. Verse 42. If you, even you, Jerusalem, the city given by God to his chosen king, David, this is Zion. Think of all that God has done for the people of this city. Think of all the times God has made himself known to them. Think of all the times God has been so kind, so merciful, so patient with them. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. It is hidden from your eyes. You can't even see it now. It's right before you. But you don't have eyes to see. And seeing, you do not perceive. You don't apprehend what's happening. And this is an apt description of the world and our lives apart from Christ. This is what sin does. We tend to think of sin as an action. When we break one of God's commands or when we fail to obey one of God's commands. We think of it as what we've done or what we have left undone. And to be sure, it is that. But sin is not only an action, it is a condition. And it is a condition we are born into this world knowing. We're not only sinners, we are in sin. Sin is this principle, this power that is at work in me, in you, in this world. And it is used by the evil one, by Satan, to tempt us, to distract us, to turn our eyes away from what we should be fixing our eyes on. And the result of this is that we're blinded, our hearts are blinded, so that we cannot see what we should see, what should be so clear to us. And this is our condition apart from Christ. Every single one of us. None of us is born into this world knowing and seeing as we should. And this is the condition. This is what sin always does. It blinds us. It dulls our hearts. It makes our hearts darkened and calloused and numb And jaded. Have you felt this? We all have. And this is the state of the world. It is estranged from the source of peace. And it's painfully elusive, right? You think of think of the optimism that characterized the world prior to World War I. People were really talking like we have put an end to war forever. Finally, we found a way to work together and to cooperate. And then 
the bloodiest, most violent war in history happen. Well, on the other side of that, surely we've learned our lesson. Surely the world will never let something like that happen again. And then comes the Second World War. Even more violent, even more bloody, even more costly than the first. And the 20th century ends up being one of the most violent, bloody centuries in human history. And and you have to juxtapose that against the fact that the 20th century is the century when we can send a person to the moon. Think of all the educational, economic advances of the 20th century. Look at how far we've come. And that's right alongside the worst war that ever happened in human history. How do we explain this? We explain it by the fact that peace is painfully elusive from those who are estranged from God. Even if we can end all wars, that doesn't change our hearts. And our hearts are at enmity against God. We are God's Enemies, you are, I am, we all are, naturally. You say, I, I don't know about that. I mean, are people pretty good? To be sure, some of us are more hateful than others, to be sure. But it's also the fact that none of us loves God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. No one loves their neighbor as themselves, as they should. We are all guilty before him, and we are all estranged, and our hearts are darkened, and the things that would bring about peace are now hidden from our eyes. Well, that was the 20th century. Now we're in the 21st century, and surely we've turned the corner on all that, right? And now what we're seeing is nations who had by and large disarmed, now they're beefing up their militaries. They're rearming. What is happening? They're beefing up their military budgets, their defense spending. These nations that thought, this could never happen again. We could never see this kind of human suffering and misery. We would never let that happen. And you see the atrocities, the horrific, horrific violence that is taking place in Europe right now. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But we think we can find peace in anything else, everything else. But the one person who can give peace, if we could just have more people educated, if we could just make more advances in technology and medicine, if we could just have more diplomacy and and coordinate better and cooperate better. It won't deliver. And it is not until you realize just how bankrupt this world's efforts at achieving peace are that you're ready to look at the source of peace. You're ready to turn to the only one who can give peace. And this is when we see that only the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who rides into Jerusalem on a colt of a donkey, only he can make peace between heaven and earth. Look at what the crowd shouts out in verse 38. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Oh, yes. Christmas, Luke 2. What do the angels sing to the shepherds? Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. On earth peace. And do you see how these are coordinating with one another? Peace on earth has arrived because this baby has been born in a manger, in an animal trough. Now there is peace in heaven God and sinners reconciled. 
those who are enemies of one another, at enmity against one another, estranged. Now they are reconciled all because of this man, the Prince of Peace. He is the only one who can bring about peace. And he can do this because of who he is. Because of who he is. We see very clearly in these verses his humanity. His humanity. His humanity shows us just how approachable he is. But look, look at this. This is a king who rides in, not on a war horse, but on a donkey. And in the ancient world, this is a sign of a king who's coming in peace. Coming in peace. And he's fulfilling these words of the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9. He says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. And don't miss this. Lowly, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Peace to the nations. He comes in peace. This is not a, a king who's high up on a horse you have to reach up to. This is a king who's down on a donkey who's, whose feet are probably dragging across the ground as he's riding. He's on our level. But the most poignant sign of his humanity comes in verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He sobbed. This isn't just a, a, a tear trickling down his face. He is in deep grief and agony for this city. And it has nothing to do with himself. He knows what awaits him. He knows he's come to die. But in this moment, it's about Jerusalem and the tragedy of these people who have a visitation from God right before them. If you, even you, had only known. If only. If only. These words are echoed in Luke 13, verse 34, when Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent, those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jerusalem! Jerusalem! As, as a, a hen gathers her chicks, I want to gather you up. I want to protect you. I want to keep you safe. But you won't have it. You're unwilling. You refuse. You choose your own way. You think you can do better. Could there be a more approachable king? who's gentle and lowly, who says, all you who are weary and need rest, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. I will give you rest. I will give you peace. Have you taken his yoke upon you? Have you known him as the gentle and the lowly one? Do you see him as approachable? who sheds real tears, who weeps, who grieves over the tragedy of human sinfulness and the judgment that follows human sinfulness. He's so approachable. You can talk to him. You can know him. And yet, we also see his divinity here. His divinity shows how all-powerful he is. His divinity shows how all-powerful he is. Look at verse 39. Not everyone is celebrating. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now, why do they say that? 
They may say that because if you look at the Pharisees in the Gospel of Luke, they tend to get upset when Jesus claims too much for himself. It's blasphemy for you to say you can forgive sins. Jesus, why are you letting that woman wash your feet? Jesus, why are you dining with sinners and tax collectors? No. It may also be that they're concerned about what this scene may show about Jesus' intentions. This is revolutionary language. What will the Romans think? And we're better off maintaining the peace by cooperating with the Romans. That's what many would think and say. Either way, they think this has gone too far. Teacher, rabbi, tell them to be quiet. Tamp down this enthusiasm. And what is Jesus' response? I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What does that mean? Well, consider Jesus' words in light of Psalm 19. Verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that I am the Lord of creation. Through me, all things were created. And I will have the praise that is due to my name. And if they don't praise me, the rocks will. Even if the rocks don't have any words, creation itself is praising him. They're declaring the glory of God. And in the face of Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God on full display. His divinity. He is the Lord of creation. He has the right to demand obedience, to call for surrender and submission to him. And he has the right to say only he can bring about peace between heaven and earth. We see it in who he is, but we also see it in what we know is coming. He is the one who was suspended between heaven and earth. He is the one through whom God was reconciling the world to himself. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, bringing about peace on earth, peace in heaven. God and sinners reconciled. Have you been reconciled to God? You will never have peace in your heart. You will never have peace anywhere. Real abiding peace until you have been reconciled to God, until you have peace with God and all other peace flows from peace with God, the source of peace. Have you been reconciled? Do you see how approachable he is? He's right here, just call out to him. And yet, he's powerful enough to save even you, to save even me. But we're not done until we note that tragic consequences will result from passing on God's offer of peace. Tragic consequences will result from passing on God's offer of peace. And everything that Jesus says here in these verses, verses 43 to 44, came to pass quite literally in the year 70 A.D. When the majority of the Jewish people decided that the best way to have peace was to rebel against the Romans. To fight against the Romans. We're done compromising with them. It's time to fight. And they rebelled in the year 66 A.D. And we're told about this from the Jewish historian Josephus. All of these things, this is happening in real history, real time and space. These aren't fairy tales. It's not make-believe. 
It's not coming out of someone's imagination. Real time and space. Real facts. Real history. And in real time and space, the city of Jerusalem was sacked. And the Roman general Titus did everything that Jesus predicts here. He set embankments against their walls. He encircled them. He hemmed them in. He laid siege against them. And horrific, horrific atrocities were committed. On a far greater scale than anything we see in the news today. And to this day, there is an arch in the city of Rome to commemorate this very victory. Titus over the Jewish people, over Jerusalem, tearing down the stones. And we don't have to wonder why that happened. Jesus tells us, it says, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you, the time of your visitation. It may be for you that this message is the time of God's visitation. What will you do with it? Is there peace in your heart? And a good way to test this is when you think about what could happen these days. If there's a nuclear war, if there's a Great Depression, if you get a deadly diagnosis, what does that do to you? You feel angst during it, worry, fear? Or do you have peace with God? So that, yes, you're a human being. You're going to have some reaction to that. But when you step back, you see that no matter what happens to me in this world, I am safe and I am secure in the one who is my peace, Jesus Christ, my Lord. And I can be content in him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you know that in your heart today? Don't let a moment pass. Don't let a moment pass. Just prior to this, we're told the painful, agonizing, heart-wrenching tale of the rich man and Lazarus. You've heard the story. The rich man, while he was alive, ate well. He ignored the poor man Lazarus outside, covered in sores, longing to eat what would fall from the table. Even the dogs are coming and licking Lazarus' sores. And yet when they die, Lazarus is carried to be with Abraham to enjoy the presence of God. The rich man is carried to Hades. He's in torment. And he, he cries out, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Please, just one dip. That's all. To soothe my pain and my regret. And and by the way, this is the most painful thing about hell is the regret of knowing God visited me. God spoke to me. God made himself known to me. Christ died for me. It was all there available to me. But I was too busy. I was too occupied with the things of this world. I was too busy making money. I was too consumed with my job. I enjoyed my Sunday mornings too much. I had places to go, people to see, things to do. I didn't bother with the Bible. Just a drop of water. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. There is no purgatory. There is no in-between. There is heaven and there is hell. That is it. And there is a chasm in between. There's no do-overs. This is the only life we have. 
Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. The rich man says, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Tell my family, please, I want to spare them what I'm enduring right now. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Okay, Moses and the prophets are enough, but if someone from the dead goes, surely, if someone rises from the dead, surely that would be enough to convince you. No. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The evidence is here. What will you do with it? The means of peace, the way of peace, the prince of peace who can lead us down the path of peace. He's here. He's spoken. He's died. He's been raised. What will you do with him? You look away. You want more evidence? Keep thinking. Keep looking. Or can you say Christ himself is my peace? And no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens out there, no matter what happens in the world, He himself is my peace. He is enough. I'm going to rest in him. I'm safe and secure in him. And I'm not going to miss this opportunity. I'm not going to be like these people. I'm going to heed the warning because I'm going to believe that what happened to Jerusalem is not even close to what awaits those in eternity who reject God's offer of peace. God is ready and willing. He sent his son who is so approachable Don't put this off. Don't delay. Seek the Lord while he may be found. May today be the day of salvation. May you know peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding in your heart. Because you have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And may you have peace with your neighbors, with your family, with everyone. No matter what they say or do to you, you're safe and secure in Christ. What can they do to you? What can man do to me? Do you know that truth? Do you know that power today? I pray that you would as we go to Lord in prayer. Father, we don't want to live another moment without your peace. We praise you and we thank you that you are worthy of all glory, laud, and honor. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our thanksgiving. You are worthy of our worship today. And we don't want to live without you because we know that apart from you, there is no peace. There is only the prospect of worry and fear and doubt. There's only the prospect of conflict and separation from you, the source of life and peace. Lord, we don't want to live apart from you. And we thank you that you sent your one and only son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in him might not perish, might not endure these grievous consequences that we see here, but might have everlasting life. And I pray for everyone within earshot of this message that they would receive Christ, they would receive the gift of peace with you through Christ Jesus, and that they would enjoy everlasting life starting now. For we pray this in Jesus' name.